Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's a little different up here. We don't have Megan this morning, or Jeremy, or Steve. Uh, so we have some great volunteers coming and helping us out this morning uh, to lead worship. If you all would like to stand with us and join us. I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive and all my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day save my soul and now your freedom is all that I know the old big dude Jesus when I met you oh, on a day when you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. When you call my name bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. That was from Numbers. The sun comes up it's a new day, darling. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship. 
Thank you uh, just for, for us being here this morning. Please be with us in our worship. Be with us uh, as, the, as the sermon is, is preached and just move within us. And God, I, I feel you this morning. Um, it's, it's different this morning. It feels different. Um, but God, I, just, I know you're here and I know you're stirring within us. And, and we just want to give you praise and thank you for being here in our worship and being here as we get to hear the new sermon series and we get to hear uh, just everything that we have in this service and i just pray that you'll be with us and yeah amen we have a special y'all can be seated sorry you're welcome good morning special little song this morning i hope that ministers to your heart as it ministers to mine. I'm ready whenever you are, guys. Aren't you glad Jesus said yes? He didn't say no. What would it take for God to say no? What would it take to let me go? What would it take for God to say no to his love? Where could I hide from his face? 
Where could I run from His grace? What would it take for God to say no to His love? Now listen. You'd have to say no to Adam's race. You'd have to say no to Abraham's face. You'd have to say no to his promised grace. You'd have to say no. You'd have to say no to the angel's voice. He never would have heard the shepherds rejoice. You'd have to say no to the son of his grace. You'd have to say no. You'd have to say no to 33 years. You'd have to say no to the blood and the tears. You'd have to say no to the old rugged cross. You'd have to say no. You'd have to say no to disciples and friends. You'd have to say no to coming again. You'd have to say no. You'd have to say no. You'd have to say no. But he said yes. 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 Well, he said yes, and the stone rolled away. He said yes, and his love's here to stay. He said yes, and there's no need to stray. Cause he said yes. So I said yes, and I fell on my knees. I said yes, now I can see. I said yes, cause he set me free. Cause he said yes. He said yes, and the stone rolled away. He said yes, and his love's here to stay. He said yes, and there's no need to stray. Cause he said yes. And I said yes, as I fell on my knees. I said yes, now I can see. I said yes, and he set me free. Cause he said yes. And I said yes, and he set me free. Cause he said yes. yes. He said yes. Yes. And the stone rolled away. He said yes. And there's no need to stray. He said yes. And his love's here to stay. Cause he said yes. So I said yes. As I fell on my knees. I said yes, now I can see. I said yes, and he set me free. Cause he said yes. And I fell on my knees. Amen? Amen. Well, it's good to be back home in good old Brazil, Indiana. I've been on the road for 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 years I've been gone. I've nine years in uh, freedom and four years plus at uh, Cayuga. And uh, God blessed our ministry both places. Got a church built and debt-free. Isn't that nice? Be able to build a church nowadays debt-free. I remember the first Sunday, I said, there'll be no burning of the mortgage. There's no mortgage. So we uh, had a great ministry there and then went to Cayuga. DS called me and said, uh, I need you in Cayuga. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, I need a seasoned pastor. And I said, well, Tim, I'm in my last season. <laughs> And he said, I need somebody to go to a church that's split. And we had a good ministry. 
the Lord blessed us. We buried a few and gained a few and got some young couples and, and turned it over to Sam Moore, a good, good friend. And uh, So we're looking forward to the future, whatever that may hold. He may come today. I'm ready. Amen? Amen. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning out of Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 1, and then we'll be going to chapter 3 and bounce around Philippians a little bit. But I want to, I want to talk about your life this morning in six words. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ. I want you to remember that. For me to live is Christ. You see, life stories has... Um, all of life stories, well, some of the life stories have six words in it. Part of Smith's Magazine, if you want to look online, uh, in www.smithmagazine.net is the brainchild and the author of Larry Smith. And here are some of the samples that he gives this morning. Kiss to Prince, and he turned into a frog. Life's a tux. I'm brown shoes. Please tell me there's more. I've lived this one. I was young and needed money. Another one is not exactly as I was planning. Not exactly as I was planning. Took different roads, never got there. How about this one? Turned out God was right. A lot of things dad told me and mom told me and the church told me it turned out that God was right. Perhaps the most poignant of all this, not quite what I was planning. There's something about each of us of these short stories life that sets my mind to wondering. And I would really like to know about the whole life summarized in these short phases. You see, life stories in six words, clever. Well, there's, here's one from the New Testament that could be added to the online magazine. To me, to live is Christ. To me, to live is Christ. These six short words sum up one person's life. Six words that say it all, and say it all to me. To me, to live is Christ. As the words, the, as with the other stories, I want to know the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. You remember that? The rest of the story? Fortunately, in this case, we have the story. These are the words of a man named Paul who lived about 2,000 years ago. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was writing from Roman prison. And life was not going too smoothly for him when he wrote these words. They were born out of suffering and conflict. For approximately 30 years he had traveled and preached. And reached out to the others in the name of Jesus Christ. And now here he was in prison. It really didn't add up. His friends and followers couldn't get into their heads. It just wasn't right. Some people were taking advantage of Paul's imprisonment and, and preaching Christ in an effort to further damage his reputation and, and cause him more trouble. Others were preaching Christ out of good motives and for the right reason. And as he wrestled with all this, he came to the point he could honestly say in verse 18 of chapter 1, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, Paul says, I rejoice and I will continue to rejoice. You see, Paul was saying that, that what was happening to him didn't matter, that his comfort and was not the issue. It was all about Christ. This peace of mind and joy in the midst of his own suffering led him to say these six words. 
to me to live is Christ. And we would be right. We would be right in saying that this is the essence of the holy life. The sanctified life. It's the mind of Christ. Now listen, laying hold of this inner man's inner being. So what's the rest of the story? Or put another way, what do these six words mean? The question we all face is how are we to find our way to these six words in our own lives? At least... Part of the answer in that question is found in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 16. Let us read that. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 16. But whatever it was to my profit, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, and I may gain Christ, and he may be found in him, not having a righteous of my own, righteous of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sharing in his sufferings become like him in his death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this or I've already made it made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have, gained, have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up, only let us live up to what we have already obtained. You know, as I was reading that, I couldn't help but think about, it's been about 40, it'll be 42 years in uh, June, when I said yes to Jesus. And those 42 years went by pretty quick. I remember st standing here as a 38-year-old doing a concert before I went to Bible college. And the rest was history. But those 42 years have passed. But as we were studying in Sunday school class this morning, some of those comments and words that were being mentioned, I thought, wow. And I, I remember as a young Christian how... Uh, Margaret Hyde, your son, told me, Rick, get in the book in Philippians and live there. Live in the book of Philippians. And I, I became like a sponge. And I just began to soak up the Word of God. And I began, it just, things just took on new meaning. And you know, I wasn't a natural man. I was a spiritual man. Because God had changed my heart. The old had passed and new had come. Amen? And that's what happened. And man, I, I, tell you, I look back and I think, I still want that, I still want that same sponge effect at 75 years old. Now, I'm only really 42. I just look 75. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a great life I've had, and uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I take a stand for him each and every day. In this part of his letter to the Philippians, believers... Paul opens his heart to them and to us, and he intentionally lets us see how these six words came to be his life story. First of all, there's the person of Christ. It began with one person, the person of Christ. In Acts 9, we have the story of Paul's conversion approximately 30 years earlier on the Damascus road of the Saul of Tarsus had a life changing encounter with Christ of the cross. And he was never the same. None of us are never the same when we come to the cross. 
On his way to Damascus to persecute the believers, Saul was knocked to the ground and, and blinded by a light like that of a noonday sun. And, and this is his testimony as he remembered it, that incredible moment. He says, then I heard a voice in Hebrew saying, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? Why do you insist on going against the grain? And I said, who are you, master? The voice answered, I'm Jesus, the one you're hunting down like an animal. But then he says, now get on your feet. I have a job for you to do. I've handpicked you to be a servant and a witness to that, what happened today and to what I'm going to show you. And I'm sending you off to the open the eyes of the outsiders so they can see the difference between dark and light and choose the light. See the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins, forgiven in a place in the family, inviting them into the company of those who begin real living by believing in me. Well, what could I do? I couldn't just walk away from a vision like that. I became an obedient believer on the spot, and I, I started preaching this life-changing, this radical turn to God, and everything it meant in everyday life right there in Damascus. And then he says, I went on to Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside and from there to the whole world. Acts 26, 14 through 20, kind of paraphrase. But Paul remembers in this third chapter of Philippians that at that moment he chose Jesus Christ over everything and everyone, listen to me, he surrendered to Christ as the master of his life. June the 25th, 1980, I surrendered to the master of my life. Praise his wonderful name. He surrendered to his will and to his purposes. He surrendered to Christ's mission in the world. And the late Paul Rees might have put it this way, that Christ softened him and broke him and won him and transformed him. softened him, broke him, won him, and transformed him. Remember that moment from the perspective of time the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, 7, and 8. But whatever it was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish I may, that I may gain Christ. Amen? Praise his wonderful name. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ, he says. What was he saying? He says, when I first met Jesus Christ, he won my heart. He won my love. And now, he says, after 30 years of ministry, even considering my present circumstances, he still won my heart, and he still won my love. See, there it is. He says, I count all things as lost for Christ. I continue to this day to count all things as lost for Christ. To me, to live is Christ. You're going to hear that more than once. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> to me, to live is Christ. Willingly and joyfully, Paul set aside, did you hear that? Willingly and joyfully, excited, enthused about what God has done in your life. You know, I thank God for the energy that he gives me at my age. I thank you for new knees and new shoulders and new eyes and cancer being removed off my forehead. and my I mean, I just try to take care of everything. When something goes wrong, I try to fix it. Hello. You're not there yet, but you'll get there. <laughs> Willingly, he says, and joyfully, Paul set aside every advantage that was his in order to be Christ and Christ alone. He now longed to be identified with him in all things. And we look at what Paul said. He said, I want to know him. He said, I want to know him, the person of Christ. 
You see, here is a deep longing for intimacy with Christ. Did you know you can get as close to Christ as you want? And he'll never turn you away. When you draw to him and draw close to him, the Bible says, draw nigh to me and I'll draw nigh to you. So you can just get as close to You know, how many times have you been turned away or don't touch me or my back hurts or, or by someone that you love? That'll never happen with Jesus. You can come to him anytime, anywhere, and know and long for that intimacy with him, to know him and to love him. Secondly, I want to know the power of his resurrection. He longs to live in the power of the risen Christ. Paul testified to the transforming power of the resurrection in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says this, I am crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I remember those words. Or I remember the words of Rodney Shanner in his report to the South Arkansas District Assembly, as Dr. Uh, J.K. Warwick wrote. He said, I'm learning to live at the foot of the cross in the power of the resurrection. I'm, live, I'm learning to live at the foot of the cross in the power of the resurrection. Thirdly, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That's the passion of Christ. I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. My life is lost in his life. We are coming close to an understanding of these six words. To me, to live is Christ. Their meaning includes this, to know him. To know him and the power of his resurrection. To know him and the fellowship of his suffering. To know him and be conformed to his death. In is Christ in all and Christ and all in Christ. You see, Paul would have no righteousness of his own, but only that which comes through faith in Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. He renounces the flesh, that principle of the self-life. His passion is to gain Christ and to know Christ. He longs to bear the likeness of Jesus Christ in his daily life so that others may see Christ in him. He might, he might well have used the words of David Bryant, not our David Bryant. But David Bryant, who wrote a book called Christ Has All. The one who has Christ has everything. The one who has everything except Christ really has nothing. And the one who has Christ plus everything else does not have any more than the one who has Christ alone. <clears throat> to me, to live is Christ. But there's more to these six words. There's more to behind these six words. To me, to live is Christ. They speak not only of a person who is in love with Jesus Christ, but also of one whose life pursuit is this Christ. The pursuit of Christ. Listen. Listen once again to Paul's testimony reflecting now on his ambition and desire to know Christ. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to the likeness of his death. When he says in Philippians chapter 3 verses 12, 16. Not that I've already obtained. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have been taken hold of, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies be, is behind and straining towards that which is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take a view, such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. To live, 
To me, to live is Christ. One person, Jesus Christ. One pursuit, Jesus Christ. The operative phrase in this passage is this, but I press on. Are you still pressing on? I'll live for him who died for me. How happy it is my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. I don't know where that came from. It just kept ringing in my head. I'll live for him who died for me. How happy then my life shall be. I'll live for him who died for me, my Savior and my God. Forgetting what is behind, Paul says, I press on. Straining towards that what is ahead, I press on. I know we get tired. I know we get frustrated. What we see on the news and I quit watching news too much. I don't watch much news. I hear it from you all. <laughs> I go sit at McDonald's, man, you really hear a lot of stuff there. Or Hardy's or wherever I go, I hear news. I just don't like to hear what I hear. I just, it's so biased in some ways, and I don't even watch much Fox. I get enough on the, I just get enough on the street. I want you to listen. I don't know where you're at spiritually, but we all have a past. All that is in the past must be left behind. Both the good and the bad must be forgotten and forsaken, preferring always what is ahead. And what is ahead? The pursuit of Jesus Christ. That's most, folks, I don't care what it is. The pursuit of Jesus Christ. Many of you may remember the course in which we declare that we decided to follow Jesus. And will not turn back. There was nothing for which Paul would turn back. Dr. J.K. Warwick wrote a message years ago. Forget the past. Accept the present. Embrace the promises of God. Forget the past. The one single pursuit was Christ and his purposes in his life and in his world. That should be our pursuit as Christians today. Amen? I believe that with all my heart. Paul says, straining towards that, what is ahead, I press on. Philippians chapter 3, 13 and 14, he recognizes that his spiritual life is not on automatic pilot. He presses on offering his entire being to this pursuit. One thing, it is intentional. It is on purpose as a sprinter leans in the finish line. So the apostle Paul leans into Christ and his purposes. It is in this passage that we find what seems to be a contradiction. Almost in the same breath, he says, not as though I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, and then all of us who are mature. It must be noted that the word translated perfect in verse 12 is the same word translated mature in verse 15, the very same word. Brother Paul Reeves points out in his book, The Adequate Man, that there is a disclaimer that rules out perfection, perfection out. The perfection to which he refers in this case is that heavenly perfection that awaits the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have not yet attained to the literal perfection reserved for the end of the age. We are not yet glorified. However, in the same breath, it is a declaration that brings perfection in all of us who are mature. I'm reading a book by E. Stanley Jones right now in my daily devotion called The Mature Life. 
man, I realize how immature I am. He challenges me every day to be more of a mature Christian, to be a mo- more of a mature husband or a father or a son, a friend. There is maturity or perfection that is to be realized in this present life. It is that perfection or that maturity that makes possible this statement. One thing I do, let me borrow from Paul Rees again, that is to say perfection of a kind, relative and not absolute, developing and not static, a derivative of divine grace and not in any sense a display of human goodness. Human goodness. We would do well to think of it as a purity of the heart that makes possible the one thing Paul did in his life that we should do as believers who choose to enter into this experience of grace. Kierkegaard wrote a book called Purity of Heart. It is to will one thing, and he ended with this prayer. He says this. He said, so many, so may thou give to the intellect Wisdom to comprehend that one thing. To the heart, sincerity to receive this understanding. To the will, purity that wills one thing. In prosperity, may thou grant perseverance to will one thing. Amid distractions, collectedness, to will one thing. In suffering, patience, to will one thing. It is this perfect maturity that makes it possible for one to have the mind of Christ, as Paul urged in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We are to have the mind of Christ. And some would differ with us on that. Some would argue with that. But I want all of him I can get. And if I can have his mind, I want his mind. (laughs) One thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining towards that which is ahead, he says, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such view of such things. And if on some point you think differently, that too, God will make clear to you, only let us live up to what he has already attained. It is this perfection or maturity that sets us in pursuit of Christ. I'm not perfect. You can ask Sonia. She'll tell you exactly. I'm not perfect at all. Uh, I make a lot of mistakes. You can ask the kids on my school bus that I drive. But I'm striving. I'm pursuing to be more like Jesus. It is this perfection or maturity that keeps the heart sensitive to the Holy Spirit. It is this perfection or maturity that holds us accountable to what we have already learned or experienced. To me, to live is Christ. Jesus is life, and life is Jesus. Is this possible? Yep. For many of us, it seems like a pipe dream. We feel as if we're living our lives without one overall pursuit. We chase after many things without any one pursuit giving coherence to our lives. If indeed it's possible, how are we going to experience this in our own life? Can we, can we hope to simply stumble along in grace and suddenly find ourselves with a single-mindedness? While there is no specific directions for us in directions, in Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Paul, Paul prays a revealing prayer for the believers in Philippi. He says this. He said, this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be, and may, may be pure and blameless until... The day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. 
to the glory and praise of God. And as we look elsewhere in the scriptures, we find more explicit language. We read in many of Paul's letters specific exhortations to his readers, to his believers, to surrender themselves completely to God in Christ. His personal testimony was one of the most complete surrender to the person of Christ and to the pursuit of Christ. He would urge all believers to do likewise. George Hewitt used to have a favorite uh, scripture. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. If I've heard him say it once, I've heard him say it 20 times. And he'd always, before he'd pray, he said, Lord, I'm reporting for duty in these prayer meetings. I remember that. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. Now, this is for all of us. To offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This, then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you this morning that this is the way into spiritual maturity or perfection. Presenting yourselves living sacrifices. This is the pathway to a life that can be summed up in these six words. To me, to live is Christ. If you don't remember anything I said today, remember this. Say it with me. To me, to live is Christ. Let's try it again. To me, to live is Christ. You believe that this morning? To me, to live is Christ. Your life in six words. What six words will you choose? Please tell me there's more. Took different road, never got there. Not exactly as I was planning. Kiss Prince. He turned into a frog. I will choose these six words, to me, to live, is Christ. Amen? I hope and pray that everyone here today has a personal relationship with Jesus and understands for me to live is Christ. There's no turning back. Bill McLeod used to sing a song, I'm going through, I'm going through, I'll pay the price, whatever others do, I'll take the way with the Lord's anointed view. I'm going through, Jesus, I'm going through. I'm going through. Folks, my yardstick's getting shorter. If you open up a ruler to 75, uh, I don't know how much longer I can go. I promise you I'd go till the day I die. You'll probably, I may go in the pulpit. I have no idea. I'm just going to keep going. I'm not going to quit. I'm not a quitter. I'm a lifer, okay? But to me, to live is Christ. Isn't that good? Don't forget that. If you're struggling in life right now and you really are really just... Ugh, just say, Lord, to me, to live is Christ. It'll help you. It'll encourage you. As our praise team comes, we're going to open up the altars, and I, th I th normally do this at this time. We're going to ask if, you, if you've got a need of any kind. And maybe you're struggling in your spiritual walk. Maybe you're really struggling, uh, drawing up close, and you're not as close as you feel like you should be. Let me just remind you, Jesus is the glue. I've told I don't know how many people. I'll be married 36 years this year. Now I'm not going to go into all the details before that, but we've often talked about it, sitting around. Jesus is the glue that keeps us together. And I told a young couple at uh, Cayuga the other day, Corey and Cora, going to be 
married. He sent me, when I left, he sent me a, a handwritten page of how much it meant to him. And he said, I'll never forget those words that you said. Don't forget, Jesus is the glue that holds relationships together. And if you're struggling in a relationship right now, it's because Jesus is not first place. Jesus has to be first. Paul says to me, to live is Christ. He meant it. You've got to put Jesus first in your life. He's got to be first. And then family. And then work. But you put God first and you allow, allow Christ to come into your life and totally fill you with this Holy Spirit and change your life and desire to be like that. Here I am at 75, still wanting more. I want more of him. I want him to, I prayed that way this morning before I came. Oh God, I need your Holy Spirit. I can't do this in my own strength. I need you, Lord. I need you this morning. And I prayed that he would come and he would flood this congregation and fill us with his precious spirit. Let's all stand this morning and heads bowed and eyes closed. And if anybody wants to come, pray for each other. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor who's not with us today. Pray for Deb. Come as they sing. Father, we thank you for this glorious Sunday that you've given us. Your name is Master and Savior and Lion of Judah and the Blessed Prince of Peace. You're my shepherd, my fortress, my rock of salvation.
You're the son of David, the king of the ages, eternal life, holy lamb of glory. Your name is life. Lord, you are life to us today. Or in each one of us today, Lord, to me, to live is Christ. Lord, help us to be better today than we were when we came. Help us to leave this place and be the voice of God on the street. Help us to share your love, your presence, your peace, your passion, your purpose, your plan with others. Lord, we all have people in our lives that, that don't know you. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be instruments as we present our bodies living sacrifices to you. Help us to trust in you, Lord, with all of our heart. And to lean not in our own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge you. Touch each one today, Lord. Touch our brother who's praying and fill him with the Holy Spirit. And may God presence be real in his life. Thank you, Lord, for the praise team who ministers to our hearts today. And thank you, Lord, for each one who's here today. Help us to be uplifted. To give praise and honor and glory. Lord, to be especially close to those who, who can't be with us today, you, for whatever reason it might be, those in the nursing homes, mom, 94 years old, still kicking. Not very high, but she's still kicking. We just pray she'd be with her and be with each one of us, Lord, as we as we grow older in thee. And help us to look to thee from which cometh our strength. We give you praise and we give you honor and we give you glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said. Be seated.
We have visitors here today. Melinda and Jeff Emmert are here to honor this uh, time in memory of her mother, Jenny Hofer. So we welcome you. Glad you got to be here. Today we do honor the life and the memory of our dear friend, Jenny Claire Hofer. What words can we use to describe such a vital lady as she was and a friend to us? I think of words like optimistic, enthusiastic, caring, warm, and welcoming. And she was beautiful, wasn't she? Those of you who remember her, she was a beautiful lady. Just to look at, she was beautiful on the inside and out. And above all, she was a joyful servant of the Lord. This lovely lady was born to Guy and Ruby Nans on June the 15th of 1930 in a little community called Cuba. Now, I was going to tell you she was born in Cuba, but I figured that would be the wrong impression to leave. She wasn't born on an island south of Florida. She was born in a little town or little area called Cuba, which is near Spencer. I had if anybody have heard of Cuba down that way. You have, I never have heard of Cuba down that way. That's where Jenny came into the world. The Nan's home was on land that had been homesteaded by some of their family members. And in that home, Jenny joined her sister Barbara, and later along came a brother Teddy and a sister Glenda. As a child, Jenny loved to play with her dolls and the kittens and the little chicks that were around her where she lived there, and uh, she learned to cook at a young age, too. And besides that, she had a God-given talent for music, both singing and playing instruments. After she'd had only three piano lessons, she became the pianist at her church. And, uh, and she continued that in that capacity until she moved away from home after she graduated from high school. Not only was she a young pianist until she, uh, during that time, but she played the organ, the guitar, and the banjo. She had the ability to play by ear. On these instruments. She had the opportunity as a child once to go to, maybe more than once, but at least once, to go to children's camp. She loved that at the camp, and but it wasn't in the budget in her family to pay for camp, so the minister at her church at that particular time paid himself for the kids that wanted to go to camp, and she was one of those kids. From that time on, she was a strong believer in camp for children. She always made it a priority for her own kids to get to go to camp. And even unto, down to her time of death, she supported children's camp here at our own church. And in her um, obituary, if you remember it at all, there was a line that said, in lieu of flowers, donations be given to the Brazil Nazarene Church's Children's Church Camp Fund. So even in her passing, she remembered that love that she had all those years. Jenny and her family attended the Cuba Baptist Church, walking three miles there and three miles back whenever the doors were open. Her grandmother walked that same distance and got there ahead of time to uh, open the church and stoke the fire so the people would be warm when they got there for service. There was no car in their family until Jenny was a teenager. And speaking of cars, here are a few lines from a poem that Melinda gave me, and, and I have it at home if you want to read the whole poem. She said I could keep it, but it was written by Jenny's brother-in-law on the occasion of Jenny's 87th birthday, and he named several things um, about Jenny that were unique, but this is one of the verses. Never known for driving slow or even carefully... Jenny liked to drive big cars, so very fast and free. One day, she met a sprayer upon a county, country lane. She ran him off way in the ditch. No one was hurt, no pain. So there, if you want to see the rest of that poem, you're welcome to. Now, and that's a side of Jenny you probably didn't know about. However, she did drive a big car. I knew that. From first grade through sixth grade, Jenny attended a one-room school, and sometimes the bridge was washed out, so she'd have to walk on a foot log across the stream or whatever it was to get to the school. And then she went to Spencer High School and got to ride a school bus there. 
But after graduating from Spencer, she did what many country girls do and did at that time. She headed to Indianapolis to go to work. And it was in that big city that she met and married Clark Jackson. Together, they had two sons, Roger and Michael. But sorrow came to their home when Clark died in a tragic accident, leaving Jenny a young widow. In 1953, Jenny and Ed Hofer were married and lived in Oneida, South Dakota. The name Hofer means farmer, and I think that's German, isn't it, Melinda? In German, it mean, the Hofer means farmer, and that indeed was Ed's passion. He wanted to farm. But hard times came along, and they moved back to Spencer, Indiana, to raise their family. Jenny and Ed had three more children, Cynthia, Melinda, and Mark. And if you have ever seen two girls that looked like their mother, Melinda and Cynthia, look like their mother. Melinda met and married Jeff Emmert, and together with their three children, they were an active part of our church for a number of years. And it's good to have them back today. Playing piano, teaching Sunday school, and a variety of other church activities filled Jenny's life along with caring for Ed and their five children. When Mark was just three years old, he was the youngest, Jenny went back to school and became a licensed practical nurse. At that time, the government was paying the school costs for nurses. They needed nurses. And they also paid child care. So Jenny's grandmother, who watched little Mark, was paid child care for doing so. Jenny worked as a nurse in obstetrics and the nursery in the hospital, as well as doing an occasional stint in labor and delivery. That employment in the Bloomington, Indiana Hospital lasted 20 years. Jenny wasn't an outdoors gal. She was a homebody. Even though she had a nursing career, she cooked and sewed, gardened and did ceramics and baked and decorated cakes, all while mothering five kids and doing so alone when Ed had to work away from home and could only come home on weekends. A quick note about Je uh, Jenny's cooking was she was a marvelous cook and baker and always cooked from scratch. They said there were no box meals on Jenny's table at home. A further note about her sewing abilities. She could look at a garment and then design what it was. She and Melinda and Cynthia sometimes would go up to Indianapolis to the L.S. Ayers department store, if you remember L.S. Ayers in Indianapolis, and they had a tea room that was a real special place to go. Well, once in a while they would go and treat themselves, and then they would take a stroll through the boutique section of L.S. Ayers and look at those beautiful dresses that they couldn't afford. Well, Jenny stood there with a piece of paper one day and sketched a dress that Melinda loved. It was a formal. She sketched it, went home, designed it, made it, and even put ostrich feathers around the neck. Did I get the feathers right, Melinda? Okay. <laughs> she made it herself, did all of that. So she, oh, and by the way, L.S. Air's price was $500 for that dress. And Jenny Hofer's price was 75 So she was, was thrifty. In 1951, Ed and Jenny were invited by friends to visit the Nazarene Church in Martinsville, Indiana. They enjoyed what they heard and saw and felt there in that church and became members. Later, they attended the Gosport Church of the Nazarene, and Jenny held just about every position there was in that church while they attended and worshipped there. As time went on and the years accumulated in their lives, the Hofers moved to a home just outside Brazil and just down the road from Melinda and Jeff's family. And at that time, then they became a part of our church. They were members of a small group that met at our house for a time, and it was all ages. We had the young, the middle, and the older, and they were the older at that time, but they fit in perfectly with our group, and we loved having them there. Rheumatoid arthritis and its painful effects were constant companions of Jenny's for many, many years. After Ed's passing, Melinda and Jeff made a home for Jenny with them in their big farmhouse, even installing an elevator chair so that Jenny could go up and down safely to her special living space downstairs. She was delighted when friends and family came to visit her there and was uncomplaining even in the midst of her physical pain and suffering. She smiled and laughed a lot. It was a joy to be around her. And she just made life better for everyone who knew her. 
Her interest was always with others, not dwelling on herself and her own problems. When I would go see her, she would always ask about our grandson, who was having troubles at that time and needed extra prayer and concern. She cared and prayed for, for Jackson. And she was concerned about all of our children and most of yours, I imagine, and prayed for you. She adored her own grandchildren, of course, and loved to share their accomplishments and what they were doing with Our Lady's Prayer Group on Tuesday mornings. Jenny departed this earth on October 21st, 2020, at the age of 90, to be with her Lord and Savior. She had spent her last several weeks in the nursing home, and one of the nurses said that Jenny was the only person she ever saw who had a smile on her face after she had passed away. I think she saw Jesus. I think she was smiling because she saw what was lying ahead for her. That's what she had lived for all those 90 years. But in any case, her positive Christian influence will long be treasured by her 12 grandchildren, 15 greats, and four great-great-grandchildren, and her family and all of us who were her friends. Her favorite verse from Scripture was Psalm 71.5, For you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. I think if Jenny could say anything to us today, she would say how fast those 90 years went. Have you noticed how fast life is going these days? Even young people are saying that life is just going by in such a hurry. And it is. My own mother, when she was heading for heaven, she, she had just missed age 84 by a, three weeks, I think it was. And she said, 84 years, and it's gone so fast. I don't think if we live to be a, over 100, which many people are doing now. You know, you see in the paper, in the obituaries, the ages are getting older and people are living longer. They would all tell us how quickly it went, I think. And so regardless of whether we go the way Jenny went or we meet in the air, it's going to be soon for all of us, I think. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Do you want to stand as we dismiss? Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the King Soon and very soon We are going to see the King Hallelujah, hallelujah We're going to see the King No more crying them We are going to see the King going to see the king no more crying there we are going to see the king hallelujah hallelujah we're going to see the king no more dying there we are going to see the king no more dying there we are going to see the King. No more dying then. We are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. God bless you all. We'll see you next week.